Vítajte pri počúvaní podcastu Ines. Všetky naše ďalšie podcasty si môžete vypočuť na stránke ines.sk lomitko audio. Prajeme vám príjemné počúvanie. Hosťom dnešnej epizódy je profesor Michael Munger z americkej Duke University, ktorý bol tiež hlavným rečníkom na šiestom ročníku seminára rakúskej ekonómie, ktorý sa uskutočnil v marci 2015 a ktorý každoročne organizuje INES. Our guest today is professor Michael Munger, an economist and director of philosophy, politics and economics program at Duke University in the United States of America. Uh, Michael Munger is author of several books. Uh, the recent one is Choosing in Groups Analytical Politics Revisited. Professor Munger is well known in academic circles for his work on the self-invented topic of EU voluntary exchange. Uh, Michael Munger is a keynote speaker at a seminar on Austrian economics organized by Ines in March in Moimirovce. Nice to have you here, Mike. It's a pleasure to visit. Uh, my first question will go to the uh, EU voluntary exchange. Can you briefly uh, introduce uh, the idea and the concept? I noticed that philosophers and economists were talking past each other. Economists tend to think that all exchanges are voluntary. Philosophers wonder whether exchanges are voluntary, but they put kind of odd conditions on them. So economists often think of competitive markets as being the solution to all kinds of things, but competitive markets assume there's many buyers, many sellers, and what they call homogeneous product, that things are more or less the same regardless of who you buy it from. Philosophers tend to think of one-off exchanges between two people where one has more power. So suppose that I'm in the desert and I'm dying of thirst, I have quite a bit of money, but I don't have any water. I hear a truck come over the hill and I think I'm saved, I'm going to live, this person can give me water. I notice that it's a taco truck. So the truck has a sign that says one liter of water, a thousand euros. Three liters of water, 2,500 euros. So you can save 500 euros by buying the special. Well, philosophers would say that this is unfair, that the person who is selling the truck is taking advantage of the desperation of my situation. And that would mean that it's not voluntary. So what I tried to do was add to the usual conditions for a valid contract one more, which means that you are not desperate, you are not coerced by circumstance. Now, here's the thing that I think is interesting. In that example, suppose we made the transaction illegal. That means the guy in the taco truck would not be out there looking for people to sell water, and I would die. So the odd thing about it is that we say that we're concerned about the welfare of those who are somehow obliged to buy things because they have no alternative. And our solution is to outlaw the exchange, thereby marooning them at a situation that by premise we think was unacceptable. So here's really the bottom line, I think. Markets are the way out of desperate situations. They're not an ideal way out, but there's no other better way out of them. What you're really objecting to most of the time is the pre-existing set of conditions that mean that people have very little wealth or power. That's really the problem. That's the reason we object, for example, to sweatshops. A sweatshop is a place where someone doesn't have a very much pay, they don't have very good safety conditions, but the solution would not be to close the sweatshop. That would mean that the person would become a prostitute or sell drugs or something even worse. Markets are the solution. Markets are the way out when the problem is poverty. So do you have uh, examples of exchange in today's economy that are not EU voluntary? Well, once you start to think of this, it turns out that I have to say, you know, I, what I thought was I was going to go teach the philosophers a lesson. And what happened instead was I sort of changed my mind. There's a lot of transactions where they kind of have a point. So it used to be that when I would look at what are in the United States called price gouging laws, And a lot of places, these are laws that, after a disaster, restrict how much the price can go up for products that are necessities. I just, because I'm an arrogant economist, I just thought that people who disagreed with me were not very bright. But it turns out that this intuition, that having price go up is a way of taking advantage of the desperation of people that are in a really bad circumstance, is pretty universally held. 
So it might be true that unless you can show that there's a substantial supply side response to letting the price go up, that this kind of intuition that people have in a kind of stone age mind, they have a, a, an evolutionary sense they're being taken advantage of, is so widespread that the existence of these laws is easier to explain than you, an economist might think. So after Hurricane Sandy, for example, in New York, um, a lot of gas stations closed, the hotels weren't able to charge very high prices and so they got full, all the water sold out. Uh, unless there's a way for the price to elicit a big response on the supply side, the people that people sense that they're in a lifeboat uh, and it, it's unfair to use price to allocate the scarce resource. I think probably I would give more credence than I would have five years ago. I still think they're mistaken because mm -hmm. they missed the supply side response. But you know the sense that we're all in this together, we're in a lifeboat, it's a mistake to raise price is probably true. Now, the way I would come back is, and in that situation, it probably doesn't happen very often because retailers recognize that if I raise my price now, maybe I'll like make a little bit of extra money. But these customers will never forget the fact that they were charged very high prices for these necessities. So price gouging laws, all of the sort of attempts to restrict price, all of them come under this intuition, I think, about you voluntary exchange. Mm. So, for example, do you see a difference in profit of a baker or in pay payday loan maker? Like, uh, because payday loans are usually loans to uh, quite poor people that don't have the means and really don't know how to calculate the, the interest. So they are being taken advantage of, one can say. So you see the difference in the profit of these two entrepreneurs? I now appreciate more the difference that people see. And I'm not sure I see it, but I appreciate the fact that they see it. Uh -huh. So a, a baker is clearly a voluntary exchange. There's many bakers. Um, if I don't get bread from this one, I can get it somewhere else. If I don't get bread at all, I can get pasta. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I can find some starch that's bad for me. So the, it, it, the problem with payday loans is that the presumption is this person is really desperate. I still think that competition in pay, payday loans is likely to take away some of the problem. I think the real difficulty is that many payday lenders are also kind of shady. Maybe the information that they provide is not very clear. So the solution is not to, to prevent payday loans because then you're going to go to Tony Sack of Donuts down on the corner and get your legs broken because you've, you've borrowed illegally. Because the, the, remember, the premise is these people are so desperate they have to borrow at almost any price. Mm -hmm. Denying them the chance to do that makes them worse off, not better. They're going to borrow from the mafia or somebody else that's even worse. But we can help them by making sure the terms of the contract are clear and if they've signed an unconscionable contract, make sure they have access to legal counsel. So the usual things about enforcement, I think, are the solution, not denying the transaction in the first place. Hmm. And can you elaborate a bit on the uh, middleman? Uh, what was, uh, how they were seen in past, how do we see them in, uh, like now? And what is their role, what is their function in the economy? Middlemen, calling someone a middleman, uh, is almost an epithet, it's an insult. And in, if someone says, well, let's cut out the middleman, what they usually mean is that someone is buying and then reselling and making illegitimate profits. I tend to think of middlemen as being the people who make transactions possible. So one of the things to remember, um, and I think for people in the audience that haven't studied economics much, this may come as kind of a surprise, economists are visionaries in a way, because what we often focus on is things that didn't happen. When we define the cost of a policy, we're often focusing on things that didn't happen. In this case, it would be transactions that didn't happen. So if there is no middleman, there's a person who would like to sell at a certain price and someone else who would like to buy at a much higher price. But if they don't meet each other, that transaction doesn't take place. The middleman basically is someone who brokers that transaction. They buy at a low price, but one still higher then that person would accept, and then they sell at a high price, but one still lower than that person would accept. So all three people are better off, and neither none of those transactions would have taken place without the middleman. So it's important to recognize that economists see things that didn't happen, and that's usually how we measure cost. So let, let's move topics a little bit, like uh, let's move to the guaranteed income. That was a proposal that uh, appeared also in Slovakia uh, 
there was a guy, uh, politician uh, Richard Sulik, who introduced flat tax in Slovakia. He had, he had another proposal, quite radical one, uh, to introduce uh, guaranteed income in Slovakia. We would be the first European, maybe also first country in the world that would have it. So what are the main advantages in your opinion of this kind of uh, social system, as I would call it? Well, there are, I think, two kinds of liberals or two kinds of market advocates. One is the kind who thinks of markets as a kind of destination and imagines what nearly perfect markets would look like. Another is how I would consider myself, which is a, a directionalist. And they're more pragmatic. They're trying to find policies that kind of split the difference or make things better. So one of the problems that I see that we have is that we have a wide variety of different relatively efficient, inefficient welfare programs. So the proposal would be to consolidate all of those, convert them to cash, pay back a dividend to taxpayers so that at the total cost of the program are less, and then take all of that money and give it in a lump sum in cash to the poor people we say that we care about. So in this case, eliminating the middleman, all the bureaucrats that administer the program and that impose conditions is actually a good thing because those bureaucrats in a political system are not creating any value. All they're doing is soaking up part of the payment and preventing people from being able to do with the money what they want. Now, I think there's a number of objections to this, but if you think of it as a kind of second best, the two things that it does is it increases the autonomy of poor people. That is, they get to make their own choices. And many of economists are subjectivists. We don't think that a bureaucrat can judge what are the best needs of all the different kinds of families, all the diversity of needs that they face. We think that individuals are better judges of their own welfare. The second thing is that it would actually save money provided, and this is a difficult problem, that we didn't then add on a bunch of other programs. So I think a legitimate objection to basic income is that not that it would replace all of the existing programs, but that it would be in addition. It would create an additional entitlement, and in a way it would create an additional sense of almost like being addicted to public payments because that's something that you would come to expect. The reason I think to discuss it is to make people realize just how much money is being spent. If you take the total amount being spent on welfare, divide it by the number of poor people, there shouldn't be any poor people because there's enough there to raise all of them out of poverty. But we take the money to them in a leaky bucket. It drips and drips all over the sidewalk. All sorts of other people get it. Interestingly, there is a program like this in place already in the state of Alaska. So Alaska has a, a program where a certain amount of all of the natural resources, uh, oil, gold, other things that come out every year, are divided among all the citizens. So they get a payment once a year from this fund. It's something on the order of three or $5,000. So that's the one that basic income advocates actually point to. It's been on the books now for 20 years. Um, and I think a lot of people would say it's probably working. The thing about Alaska, though, is there's many poor people who live in situations where they really can't work, and it's a way of sharing access to the, the natural resource wealth of the state. It is true that no one's tried it in a state that actually, in a, or a country, that actually has uh, cities. Mm. Uh, people in Slovakia are usually not that familiar with uh, sharing economy, with the Uber and other uh, services. Can you elaborate a bit on what the sharing economy means? What is Uber? Why is why it is perhaps uh, rev revolutionary? I think that the sharing economy it has the potential to revolutionize the way that transactions take place. The sharing economy, I would summarize as saying that these are entrepreneurs who are specializing in selling a reduction in transactions cost. So that was sort of hard, let me say it again. The sharing economy is entrepreneurs who are specializing in selling the reduction in transactions cost. And so again, we go back to things that don't happen. There's all sorts of transactions that would be mutually beneficial that never take place because they're swamped by transactions cost. So I might rent something to you, I might sell something to you, and the benefit is something like $5. That is, you would pay me $5 more than I'm willing to sell it for. But to find each other, to transport the product might cost 10, which means that that swamps the potential benefit. But if we can find a way to reduce the transactions cost of the exchange, 
then all sorts of exchanges will take place that will be mutually beneficial. So the example many people think of is Uber. And uh, Richard, with you actually, I, I saw an example of a, a software program called Hop-In, where we were able to get a taxi that in, in that transaction had some of the properties of Uber. And what was interesting about it was that you can find a taxi, you can solve the problem of trust because you can identify the person, and you can handle the transaction in a way that doesn't involve any money changing hands. So there's no safety concerns, there's no worry about me running afterwards, there's no worry about the taxi driver overcharging me. There's all sorts of things that once you start to think of the reduction of transactions cost as something you can sell. We don't think of it that way. The reduction in transactions cost is something that you can sell. So the example that I always use, and it's kind of trite, is that most families in the United States have a power drill somewhere in the house. Now, the total lifetime use of a power drill is something under 10 minutes on average. Because you drill a hole in the wall, you put a screw in it, you've used it for 30 seconds, you put it back in the shelf, and you use it again 10 months later. Now, I use mine a lot more than that because I break stuff. but and I have a very demanding wife, but many people only use it a few times. Why don't you rent a power drill? Well, the answer is that it'd be really expensive in terms of your time, if nothing else, to go to the hardware store, stand in line, pick out a drill to rent, drive home, use it for 30 seconds, and then drive back and turn it in. So renting is expensive, but suppose I could call an Uber driver or a hop-in driver, but it's, it's not for transportation, it's like Amazon. There's a list of things that I can buy. And so I go through my phone and I tap the power drill button and an Uber driver who happens to be near that hardware store, I don't need to know anything about it. Whoever's the closest Uber driver is assigned by the software. He goes and picks it up, he delivers the drill, it's on my front porch, it costs me two bucks, I use it for the 30 seconds, I hit Uber again, another driver, whoever happens to be closest, there's no search costs, picks it up, each of them gets paid $2. For $6, I've rented a drill. I don't have to store it. It's a higher quality drill, it works better. So it's a commercial quality drill, I don't have to store it. And now that one drill can serve 20, 30, 50 families. So it actually is, is much more useful in the way that we allocate resources. Once you start to think of the things that we used to own as things that we might be able to rent, cars like Uber, Houses like Airbnb or drills in ways that we haven't even thought of are going to be the things that we can sell tomorrow. So the bottom line is taxi companies are not the ones that should be worried about Uber. Amazon or the big sellers of stuff are the ones that should be worried about Uber because we're going to be renting rather than owning 10 years from now. So aren't you afraid that there will be a, another wave of regulation trying to stop these things like hotels in New York complaining about Airbnb, for example? There clearly will be, and the difficulty is that many companies that are threatened by this are going to fight it every way that they can. So the kind of regulation, some of it actually makes sense. I mean, maybe Uber, the Uber cars don't really have enough insurance. Maybe the drivers aren't licensed or competent or experienced enough. But some of the things that they want to do is one of the advantages of Uber is I was just in New York for a week, I used Uber two or three times every day. I'd be in a restaurant, I would call Uber, and two minutes later when I got outside, he was there. So I don't have to wait. So one of the restrictions more and more taxi companies wait want is a waiting period. Well, there's no benefit to that. That actually harms the consumer. 15 minutes, the city of Seattle proposed 30 minutes. You weren't allowed to pick up for 30 minutes. So, but to, to, to Seattle's credit, they, they, they said no. They said no to that kind of regulation. The, the, the difficulty is that all of these transformative uh, economic revolutions are corrosive of existing institutions and destructive of current arrangements for producing stuff. So you may know the English word sabotage, it's actually a French word, but it, uh, the, it, it comes from the sabot, the wooden shoe. And so sabotage was the act of throwing your wooden shoe into a power loom to break it. So during the Industrial Revolution, the workers saw these power looms were going to take their jobs. And so they, they would throw their sabot into the machine to break it. And we're going to see the same sorts of things. But the, you have to realize, these regulations are sabotage. These are the rear guard action of a dying order. And so the revolution that's going to take place can't be stopped. 
Oh, so you're an optimist. They, I'm an optimist. They, they won't succeed. Okay, let's move to, to the last topic of our interview. Like, what about education? Like, is internet really changing education or not? Like, these things like Khan Academy or blogging professors. Do you think, is it a real lasting change to how we educate young people? Or is it just a gimmick that will go away and we will keep the system that we had for decades? Well, in some ways we've had this system for centuries because the German university system that developed in the 18th and 19th century is one that many of us still sort of look to. There have been a few changes around the margin, uh, but the, the caricature of it is the sage on the stage, the old guy standing up there talking uh, from notes that he hasn't thought about in a long time and the students not thinking about it much either but writing Sleeping. it down in their notes. <laughs> <laughs> and them. you know there have been a few changes so we have electronic textbooks now and maybe somebody records the lecture so in some ways it would be a good thing if it were to change I'm not sure that we have a model that's better one of the things about universities is that there's several different aspects of universities that online education is not very good at replicating so one of the things is what we might call the admissions office. The admissions office is a, a vetting, it's a background check to say somebody looked at this person and found them to be superior. So that's a signal. If you get into Harvard, if you get into the school where I teach Duke, then that alone is worth something. You could just study basket weaving for four years and when you get out, and that's a lot of our students, do, that's called women's <laughs> studies, but a lot of our students actually take one of those departments of indignation studies and they still get a, a, an important degree if only because of, of that signal. And then there's the football stadium or the soccer stadium, the, this sort of tribal mentality where you're part of something larger than yourself. And in the U.S., for basketball and football, that, that's, those are really important things for us to identify with. And then there's the fraternity house. And the fraternity house is a really terrific mating service and dating service. It's a way of finding smart, wealthy young people who are also interesting, and it keeps everybody else out. And online things are not going to help with that. So the one thing that they would help, that online courses do help, is the tyranny of another structure on campus that I would call the clock tower. So the clock tower has a kind of tyranny of time that don't make sense for, doesn't make sense for education. So classes meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 11.30. There's no reason that I can't look, look at that material almost any time. Mm -hmm. And the other thing the clock tower does, at least in the U.S., is it measures out four years or five years. A lot of people would like to study less or more than that. So the, the tyranny of time and place, the, the, the Internet can overcome. Mm -hmm. But the fraternity house and the mating service, the, 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 the entry signal that you get from the admissions office and the sort of tribalism you get from uh, sports, it can't easily be matched. So I, I think universities, as we now see them, are going to be around for quite a while. But if they don't change, they're going to lose an awful lot of their value to newer and better systems. Mm -hmm. And I have the very last question. What are the three books that you would recommend to the person who is new into the economics? And there's only three, and they're <laughs> brand new. They don't have to be new, like three most well, important. The new, the new person, the, the person. Yeah, the person, person is a freshman, freshman, freshman student like, of the, economics. One of the things that's hard about studying economics is that as soon as we get someone excited about economics, we immediately tell them to go study math. <laughs> And so we lose a lot of, of students that otherwise would be interested. Um, there's. Let me give one that's a little bit off the wall and then two more traditional ones. The first one, and it, you might not expect, is called The Box. And it's written by a guy named Mark Levinson. And it's about the invention of the container box. And it's what got me to start thinking about the importance of selling reductions in transactions cost. Because ships for centuries had been loaded and unloaded by hand and they were built in a certain way. And it meant that the cost of transportation, loading and unloading, dwarfed the physical cost of the product. And what Mark Levinson talks about in that book is how this reduction in transactions cost destroyed unions, it destroyed labor relations, it destroyed much of the way we think about the origins of products. And so if you start looking at 
at the, in the again the book is called the box um, then that gives you a way to think about the increased globalization of the economy that when you study economics you'll have more examples for um, then the Henry Hazlitt book uh, economics in one lesson um, is I think one of the most important because it it gives you a background about how economists think about markets and all too often economics classes have nothing to do with markets we're just talking about applied math and optimization and I can't resist saying that the, the third one is uh, it's actually not even Hayek's book so <laughs> I'll, we'll, we'll make it a, a shorter one Hayek's 1945 well, since you said three, let me let me use two articles instead of one. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to cheat. Through. I'm going to cheat, <laughs> cheat on your question. Uh, and, and interestingly, both of them were written in 1945, which is surprising. So it, it's Hayek's book in the American Economic Review about information and about the importance of of selling information and acquiring information is the thing that we're concerned about for markets. So what markets do is they don't take prices as an input, which is the way that most economists treat it. it prices are the result of a discovery process. And it, it, we depend on markets to provide information in that way rather than the way that we often teach it, which is we start with prices and then we use that to allocate resources. That has it exactly backwards. The other 1945 article was in Economica. It's called the, P the Economics of a POW Camp by R.A. Radford. And again, in terms of just its practical insight in the way that markets emerge spontaneously and serve so well the day-to-day -day needs of people, it, it's just unsurpassed. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for being with us. It was a pleasure. It was Thank really you. great to get to talk.